I'm going to have you turn over to Luke chapter 4. And we're going to focus on Luke 4 and 5. And I've got something that I believe is a timely word for us. But here in Luke chapter 4, I want to show you something. Uh, just let's look at one verse of scripture uh, at, in verse 18. Jesus said, this is 418, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to do something. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to live a life of ease. No. To kick back and watch football. No. There's no anointing for that. <laughs> Uh, you might be anointed to play football, but there's no anointing to watch it. He anointed Jesus to do what? Preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent him to do what? To heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So the spirit of the Lord was upon him to do something that he was sent to do. And then as you get on over to the end of the chapter, verse 42, when it was day, he departed and went into a, a desert place, and the people sought him and came unto him and stayed him that he should not depart from them. So in other words, they didn't want him to leave. They were trying to get Jesus to please stay, okay? Notice what he says in verse 43. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. In other words, I'm sent to do this. I'm sent to preach. I'm sent for this purpose. The Amplified says I was sent for this purpose. The good news says that is, that is what God sent me to do. And verse 44, and he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. In other words, he went and did what he was called to do or sent to do. This is what I'm to do. I am to go about and give you, well, in fact, uh, you know, Dana, can we put uh, the Amplified, the, the, the entirety of the Amplified up there, verse 43, um, Amplified Bible, verse 43 of, of Luke 4. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because I was sent for this purpose. So I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also. It's not just for you. It's not just here. It's for them. It's for everyone. That's the purpose that I was sent. Okay. Now, we get on over to chapter 5. This is a, this is a great story, and we're going to look at this verse by verse, and then I'm going to show you what I believe to be the word for us today. So... In verse 1 of chapter 5, it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genesaret. So people were pressing or crowding him to hear the word of God. Boy, that would be a dream come true. If, if you wanted to know, the truth of the matter is, this is something I think about all the time. Man, just to have people pressing in to hear the good news. Share with me this gospel that you preach. We can't get enough of it. And they come from everywhere. And, you, and they're pressing upon you. And in verse 2, he saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, verse 3, which was Simon's, and he, he prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now, so you can, you can see what's happened here. He's at, the, he's at the, the shoreline, and the people are pressing upon him because they want to hear what he has to say. He's got to get into a boat and come out and back up from the crowd so that that leaves them, maybe you can say, on the beach. And now he's able to just preach to them, okay? Otherwise, there's too many, the crowd is too great, and this is a, this is a nice problem to have, okay? Verse 4, 
when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draw or catch or however you want to word that. I'm not even sure that I'm pronouncing the word right there. But Simon in verse five says, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. <clears throat> Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Dana, could we put up uh, verse 5 in the Amplified Bible, please? Simon replied, Master, we worked hard all night to the point of exhaustion. Caught nothing in our nets. But at your word, I will do as you say and lower the nets again. Hmm. So <clears throat> Peter, obviously, you know, was a fisherman. <clears throat> he and his, his crew, if you will. The Bible says that they worked all night to the point of exhaustion. So these are professional fishermen who are used to doing what? Going out and catching fish. That's what they do. Jesus, well, master, rabbi, teacher, Jesus was raised uh, in the home of a carpenter. Carpentry and fishing are two different things, right? And so here's Jesus saying, well, go launch out now and lower your nets again. And Peter's like, we're, 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 we're tired. We've been working all night and nothing has happened. We've been at this all night and really there's been no success. I've been doing what I'm called to do all night long to the point of exhaustion and I'm not really seeing the results that I think that I should. I've been doing this all night. In fact, Gary's been doing it for 28 years. Hmm. It's a long time. It's a long time. I thought by now this church would have been easily 500 people on a regular basis. I got nothing. I got yous. That's a beautiful thing. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But when you start to realize that there is a large planet out there with billions of people, and we got quite a few people here in our communities, where are they going? Who's teaching them? Do they even know what the gospel is? Are they being properly instructed? Are they experiencing the things of God? Do they have freedom? See, those are the things that are in my heart. And it's wonderful that we have a nice family, <coughs> use, use of the family. <coughs> it's wonderful that we have a nice family. But God intends for the family to grow here. It's always been the plan of God for the family to grow. It's always been that way. It's amazing how Peter and his partners have worked, you know, the fishing company, that uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, uh, Peter and Friends Fishing Company. And man, they've done everything that they know to do and nothing has happened. And Jesus said, well, if you go over here, out, launch out into the deep and let the net down. And when they did that, verse six says, when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. Let, what, the next one, yeah, when they had, there it is. That's, is that the, oh, the Amplified, Dan, I'm sorry. Uh, for that one too as well, Amplified Bible. When they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets were at the point of breaking. Okay. Then you get over to <clears throat> verse seven and they, this, they beckoned under their partners which were in the other ship that they should come and help them and they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. Huh. Man, wow. Like, can you see what's happening here? There's so many fish that the boats can barely stay afloat with. That's a lot of fish. I mean, they literally were out all night. They did everything that they probably had done all along. I mean, these are guys that are fishermen. So they didn't deviate from what they usually did, except they had nothing to show for it. And then here's Jesus, this carpenter, and says, well, if you go over there, 
this is what's going to happen. Verse 8 says, When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and he said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. I can imagine Peter was like, Oh my God, (laughs) overwhelmed, if you will, right? And in verse 9, for he was astonished in all that were with him at the draught or the catch of the fish which they had taken. Verse 9. Some translations say um, amazement had seized him and all his companions. Amazement had seized him. Uh, I believe the Amplified says they were completely astounded. The Aramaic Bible in plain English says, for awe had seized him and all of them who were with him. In other words, it just took hold of him like they knew something spiritual had just happened. This is not normal. This just doesn't happen. We know this is what we have spent our life doing. And so now they're like, uh, okay, we are completely taken with amazement and wonder. Awe, it's like, The fact that Peter said, I'm a sinful man, just go away from me, shows you that they have this immense, incredible awareness that something holy and wonderful had happened. And I find verse 10 very interesting. For, and so was also James, John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, fear not. Fear not. Some translations say, don't be afraid. Fear not, don't be afraid. Well, what are they afraid of? What's causing them to be afraid? Something holy and significant, something outside the realm of what we know to be normal has taken place. Now, try to stay with me. I know this is going a little bit slow and very calm, and I didn't expect it to be this way. But I've learned, whatever it is, it is. We're just going to do what we're doing. Something outside the realm of normalcy, something outside of our comfort zone, something that is just, this is unusual. I'm struck with awe. And Jesus actually had to say, don't be afraid. Why would you say that? Why why would you say to seasoned fishermen when they just caught the biggest catch probably in, in in their life, they've never seen anything like it, why would you say don't be afraid? Doesn't that seem weird to you? Well, when you consider that the church allegedly is praying for revival, and when something significant begins to take place, we draw back from it. We draw back from it because we've never seen anything like it. See, what churches call revival now, that's not revival. There are too many of us who have been desensitized because we label certain uh, uh, meetings or events and we say, revival is here, a revival service, a revivalist is coming to town, and you may have a few goosebumps and a few things that are said that are significant, but that ain't revival. And when it happens and when it comes, it just causes us to be like, uh, I ain't never seen nothing like this. Don't be afraid. Fear not. And he says, he doesn't just stop there. He says, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. From now on, you're going to be catching men. Well, when I think about catching fish, and then I draw the parallel between catching fish and catching men, doesn't that seem to indicate that there has to be some purpose, some strategy, that that there has to be some sacrifice involved? Either you got to get up early. I mean, at least any time I've gone fishing, which hasn't been a lot lately. In fact, I didn't go at all this year or the last year. But there has to be strategy, resources, and effort involved when you're going to go catch fish. And the same is true for when you're going to go catch men. Jesus said from now on, you're going to catch men. He said from henceforth, you shall catch men. From this moment forward, everything is about to change. (laughs) 
from this moment forward, you're, you guys are absolutely caught and taken with wonder and awe and fear at the same time. And Jesus said, Pete, don't be afraid. From this day forward, your life is changing. You're going to catch men. You're going to catch men. This is the heart of God. It's winning souls. You can say whether you're catching men or winning souls, it's the same thing. Going after them and bringing them into the kingdom is your assignment. Going after them and bringing them in. Jesus said, this is why I'm sent, is to preach the kingdom of God to the other cities as well. This is what we're here to do. We're not just here just to be one big happy family and that's it. Just bless us and our families and no more, Lord. And yet we cry out and we pray and we say, oh, Lord, you know, the harvest, bringing in the sheaves, whatever you want, whatever expression you use. And we cry out for a move of God and we pray for revival. And there are people who are sacrificing so much, praying for revival, crying out for revival, that when it shows up, they freak out. The assignment hasn't changed. Catch men. That's the assignment. And he said to Peter, I know you're tired. I know you've been working all night. And he says to Gary, I know you've been doing this for 28 years in Byron. But I got something so big and so amazing that it's going to literally astound you and cause you to be fearful. And I am trying to tell you in as gentle a way as I know how that Beacon Hill Church is not ready for what's coming. And we have got to get ready. We have to do it. And it is my job to lead you into this. This is my assignment now. My assignment now is to help get you ready because the end time move of the spirit or the end time harvest or the end time outpouring or the end time revival is just around the corner before it's time to shut the door. He's going to get in as many people, as many as, as we can fit. Well, this church isn't big enough. Well, you better partner with somebody else then. You better get somebody else in, but you better call some other people and say, hey, I need some help. We got some stuff that's getting ready to happen here, and we don't have enough seats, and we don't have enough parking. What are we going to do about it? I don't know, but I'm saying this is, like is going to be your last shock and awe campaign from heaven. The final sweeping move of the Holy Spirit. And some of you are like, hey, we've heard this before. Ain't nothing. See, that's the problem. We've heard this too often and too much, and we've had too much imitators and imitation. We're not going to advertise a revival service. We're going to advertise a preparation service preparing for revival. Got to get you ready. I got to get ready. What is it going to look like? I don't know, but what it looked like for them caused them to be afraid. And Jesus had to say, don't be afraid, guys. My boats aren't big enough. We need help. It's not about your comfort anymore. It's not about what you thought anymore. It's about winning the lost at any cost. But notice this, that heaven's assignment required earth's resources. Well, I ain't got much, but whatever I got, Lord, you can use. He didn't ask them for much. He just said, can I use your boat? Oh, your boat's not going to be big enough. You better get your partner's boats too. I don't know what this is all going to look like. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you I know what this is going to look like because I don't. I just know that my whole career spent in this community I have always seen and I have always believed in and I have always felt that there was something more significant than us just being a cozy, comfortable, small little country church that we all just love each other and get along and have a happy life until we die. That ain't me. It has never been me. And I have, I have set things aside in my life. 
I have pushed them down, put them on the shelf, pretty much closed the book and said, well, you know what, Lord, I'll give all that up just so that I could stay here and be their pastor. I'll put all those things aside. I won't think about it anymore. I won't talk about it anymore. We'll just have a nice service. We'll have a move of the Spirit. People will fall down when the Spirit of God is strong. They'll get goosebumps and tinglies, you know. And I pretty much resigned myself to doing that for the rest of my days. Hmm. What does that mean exactly? It means that I laid my life down for you. That's what it means. Because I wanted to. And I'm happy to do it. It's an honor. It's a privilege. It's an absolute honor and a privilege to serve you. Absolute honor and privilege to represent you. It's amazing. What, a, what an amazing position to be in. Until I realized that, God said, who told you that that's what was supposed to happen? Where'd you get that idea from? God's heartbeat has always been souls, souls. And every day more souls are being born. So there's a lot of souls on this planet right now. How many souls are aboard, sir? I don't know, eight and a half billion? Is that what we got on the planet now? That's a lot of people. That's not even counting the souls that have been before them. And that's not even counting the souls that are going to be after them. There's a work to be done here. There's a work to be done. We're based in this community. That doesn't mean that we don't go beyond the borders of this little community. It just means that this is where we're based and that there are people. There's going to be such a move of God in such demonstration that it's going to cause people to take notice and they're going to be like, uh, what just happened there? And we're going to have to say, don't be afraid. This is the final move of God. This is God showing you how much he loves you. This is God bringing as many people in as possible before the door gets shut. When is that going to happen? Could happen today. Wow. Where are we going with all this? I don't know, but I'm, I'm buckled in. I'm going. And I hope that you'll come with me. I'd like to do this with you. What exactly is it going to mean? I don't know. So the, the, the assignment, the heavenly divine appointed assignment, because that's what Jesus was on. It required the use of earth's resources. I need your boat. In fact, when I'm done using your boat to preach, then you guys are going to catch fish. And there's going to be so many that you're not going to handle. It's going to freak you out. But I'm telling you, don't be afraid because from this point forward, you're going to catch fish. And Jesus never meant for it to be one little fish here. And ten years down the road, another little fish here. Five years down the road, another little fish here. I've been wrong. I've been wrong. I lulled myself into this false sense of, oh, the small church is where it's at. I don't want this church to get too big. That's a lie. I've always seen this church, a big church, a big, thriving, amazing church full of the presence and glory of God. I've always seen that. But because things weren't happening, I thought, all right, Lord, I'll just throttle it down. I'll just back up a little bit. And I'll just kick it into a different gear, because I guess this is what it's going to be. Was that wrong of me? No, of course not. Is it wrong of you? Absolutely not. I love getting together with you guys. I love being here with you. But I've noticed something, and I have to admit something to you. I've been told that I have an unusual anointing, and I haven't been allowing it to go and, and be used. I haven't. I've noticed that every time guests come through the door who have a need, who are hungry, who are searching, there's another gear that gets shifted into. 
something happens here that it's like, hmm, it's undeniable. It's crazy what happens. And that's wonderful. You got the shepherd's heart, and you've got the fire and passion of an evangelist, and you got the two of them working together. But when we're all here and it's all just us, we don't need the passion and fire of the evangelist. You need the shepherd's heart. And the evangelist has to go out there and throw that net and bring them in. And I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know how we're going to do this. We're just going to be led and we're going to hear from God. And God's going to tell me how to do this. But if we're coming to the end, and the end of all things is near, then God's got some stuff that has to get done before we go. Because there are way too many people out there that are lost right now and on their way to an eternity without Jesus. And as far as God's concerned, that's just not okay with him. It's not okay with him that there are way too many people who still are lost. And in this community, on my watch, that is unacceptable. Totally unacceptable. Everybody in this community ought to hear the message that we preach. Everybody in this community ought to hear the gospel that we deliver. Everybody ought to hear it. This is not a gospel of works. This is not a gospel of formality. This is a gospel of grace. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But churches don't even agree on any of that. And so we have, do, do you, are you saying that you have something more significant or special? You have a corner on the market? What I'm saying is that we have revelation. We have insight and knowledge that God himself has given to us. And I don't think people understand what has happened through this ministry. I don't think people understand some of the things that have happened in this ministry, in this church. And I just want to remind you as we close of some significant things that took place. Number one, the first significant thing that took place is when we came to town, all hell broke loose. It was, it was a, a scheme and a plot from hell to discourage us and get us to leave. And when my wife laid up in the hospital, sick as can be, and my children, all young children with chicken pox, and I had to take care of them without my wife, and my wife said to me, take me back home to my mother. And I said, I can't do that because we're supposed to be here. And there she is laying in the hospital bed, and I have to bring my children to the hospital so that Val could watch them while I lay in the bed and try to close my eyes for a few minutes. Don't tell me that I wasn't feeling overwhelmed and discouraged, but I was convinced of my call, and that was to be here and stay the course. And if ever there was a time to leave and go back to Connecticut, that was it, and we didn't do it. And I said to the Lord, I said, give me a message for this church. I need to know what the heck I'm supposed to say to this church in Byron that I don't even know most of the people here. What is it that I'm supposed to say to them? And God Almighty told me to tell you that I was sent here to love you. And I said that in that storefront and everybody started weeping. That was significant to me. So all I got to do is tell them you sent me there to love them? Yep. Well, that wasn't the only thing that happened because a little bit later, a little bit after that, the Lord said, well, it was love that brought you to Byron, but it's the remnant that keeps you here. Remnant? What's the remnant going to do? The remnant has always done something significant in the word of God. Always. It doesn't take a whole bunch of us. That's the beauty of having a small country church is that this small country church is going to usher in the final move of God in this community. That's the beauty of it. We don't offer bells and whistles. We didn't build this ministry on being socially and culturally relevant. We didn't build this church on that. We established the sure foundation of the word and the spirit. That's what we did. It took years and tears to get this church to the place where this thing is, is immovable. We ain't, we ain't backed up off of nothing. We haven't backed up off of the word and we haven't backed up off of the spirit and we're not going to. And for God to tell me the things that he told me and to show me the things that he showed me in this church, in this ministry, where the Lord himself gave me an insight or a revelation or a vision. 
And I don't know what you want to call it. You can tell me I'm out of my mind. I really don't care. But as I laid on that floor under the unction of the Holy Spirit and I looked up and I saw one of my mentors and Jesus together in heaven looking over the banister of heaven laughing at me, the two of them were one. The two of them were together. They were distinct, but they were one. And I saw the both of them laughing at me. I went, dang, Buzzy was right after all. The two become one. And there they were. And the Lord said to me something that was so, it seemed so insulting to me that I thought, that ain't no revelation. He said, you know, Jesus was not an American Jew. God told me this. Well, I'm laying on the floor under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was not an American Jew. I said, that ain't no great revelation. I thought you were going to give me something good. And then it hit me. We Americanized Jesus we Americanized the church. We Americanized everything about the church. But Jesus was not an American Jew. In fact, there was no such thing as the United States of America when the Bible was being written. And I thought, dear God, what else have we messed up? And then the Lord said to me, do you want to know where the church is missing it? And I'm like, oh, do tell. Do I need a pad and pen? And I'm laying on the floor under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Bless you. Do you want to know where the church is missing it primarily? Yes, I do, sir. And he said, in our intimacy with him, we don't know how to have an intimate relationship with God. And that's all he wants with us. God's not looking for your performance. Just get that out of your head right now. And God's not even looking for perfect behavior. When you, if you can just start getting a hold of this with me, I'm telling you, this is going to change everything. Fear not. From this day forward, church, you will be fishers and catchers of men. Not just a little bless me club. And I'm sorry that I've turned this into a bless me club. And it was my fault for doing it because I wanted you to get a hold of the message and I wanted you to be blessed and I wanted you to experience victory in your life. But then what was the focus? Internal. It's like, it's not about us. It's about them. It's always been about them. And whether, listen, whether we like it or not, this is where we've come to in history is that the church age is about to close. I'm telling you, by the Spirit of God, the church age is coming the church age is coming to a close. And that scares me. And the Lord says, fear not. Fear not. Fear not. I've never known anything else. And neither have you. But it's what we were designed for. It's what we were built for. It's what we're destined for. Listen, I'm going to, I don't know, I'm just telling you, just stay strapped in with me. You don't, I'm not te- you don't have to have anything figured out. You don't have to know anything right now. It doesn't have to make any sense. You just need to know that I have just begun the process of getting us ready for this final sweeping move. I've always believed it. I've always felt it. I've always known. I can remember the day, and I'm sorry to just go on just a couple more minutes, but I can remember the day that God had told me I needed to go to Rhema Bible College. I, I, I remember the day. It completely took me off one track and set me on another course. I was not going. I had no idea what the heck Rhema even was. And I can remember the day when God said, you need to be at this school. And I went, who just said that? And I went, Val, I think God just told me I'm supposed to come here. And I, and I didn't know until years later that God told her the same thing. But I can remember going back to Connecticut. And at that time, I was working for my stepfather at that time. I've had, I've had a pretty colorful past, which you don't really need to know about that now. But, but this, this chapter of my life, I was working at his print shop. And, and, and I scored highest in the military of, with, the, with the organizational stuff. And uh, that was my, my specialty, was organization and, and being able to do things like that. You wouldn't know it now. Look at my house and my office. But, so I ran the office. I ran the front office. Man, I tell you what. You ask my wife. I'm not easy to work for. Am I right? 
I am picky oon, nitpicky, detail picky oon. And I can remember being in the front office and I had this little AM radio on the side of my desk and W, uh, the, the Christian radio station out of Long Island, New York, uh, WLIX, and, and, and I waited at a certain time, R.W. Schambach came on. And it stirred my heart so much. And I would listen to the stories of healings and of miracles. And I used to say to myself, this has got to be false advertisement. Like, this stuff don't happen. This can't be real. But in my heart, I knew that miracles, signs and wonders are a part of the gospel that we have been commissioned to preach. And that if they're not happening, it's not God's fault, it's on us. And my heart was stirred, and I contacted that ministry, and I said, I've got to know, did these miracles actually happen? I've got to know, did these things actually take place? And do you know that years later, I can tell you, I know that I know that I know it's right, because now it's happened through my ministry. You ask Chief Mike Lewis, we've raised the dead. You ask him whether or not that's the truth. He can tell you, yeah, we have raised the dead. And you're a part of that. Who's, who raised the dead? We did. The dead have been raised. Miracles have taken place. People have been healed. Peter McDonald, I remember the day when he prayed for this woman in the storefront church, and he had her bend over <coughs> and touch her toes, and she began to weep. And I snuck up to her. I said, sister, if that hurts you, please don't do it. And she said, no, you don't understand. I have a steel rod on my back. I'm not supposed to be able to bend over like this. And I've seen some stuff happen. And that's a part of the gospel that we preach. My heart has been stirred for years. It has cried out for the miraculous. God sent me to a Bible school that would teach me the word of faith. Not, not just theory. Not just programs. You know, uh, I mean, there are people who believe that the day of miracles is, is over. And I'm telling you, they've come too late to tell me that. Because I've seen them. I've watched people be delivered and healed. I spoke to a woman who couldn't have a baby, and I said, in Jesus' name, you will have. And she got pregnant, and she wasn't supposed to. And she was like 40 years old. I mean, some of these things that we've had just little trickles of, this is what God intends to do on a huge, massive scale. So much so that we have to call our partners and say, hey, we need more boats. See, what I'm talking about is going to fill every church to overflowing. You're not going to have to come up with a clever gimmick to try to get people interested in coming to church. You won't be able to keep them away because of the miracles that are taking place. I don't know how I stumbled upon this just the other day uh, from 1954, a preacher who was speaking under the unction in the pulpit in 1954, and he said that these miracles in the last days are going to arrest the attention of the heathen, and you're not going to be able to keep them away from the church. Well, that's the plan of God, because the church age is coming to a close, and the church is not going to go out weak and emaciated and broke, busted, and disgusted. The church is going to go out in a blaze of glory. Hallelujah. This is what I'm talking about. This is where we've come to. I've waited my whole career for this. I've waited my whole professional career to be able to tell you, thus saith the Lord, we're coming to the end of the church age. And there's going to be a final sweeping move that's going to bring so many people in. It's going to cause you to be afraid. You're going to be like, well, my God, what do we do? What do we do? What do you do when we have to have church service every single day, all day? And it goes on week after week after week after week. Can we sustain that? Are we going to be able to do that? You know, I can't be up here doing this seven days a week. Some of you are going to have to get up here and start doing some of your stuff. Some of you are going to have to start being able to take over and say, hey, go get some sleep. We got this. I'm telling you, this is going to change everything, but I've waited my whole life for this. Oh, you're just getting yourself all worked up. I hope so. I wasn't sure this was going to happen today. I just said, I'm just going to give you a cute little message. <laughs> and the Lord said, no, you're not. You're going to tell them. So I'm telling you. Are you ready? And the answer is no, you're not. So don't even sit there and say, yes, we are. 
We've been praying, Pastor. You might have been praying, and you need to be, but you're not ready for what's coming, and I'll tell you why. Peter wasn't ready. When Jesus said, go over there, drop your net, Peter wasn't ready. It scared him. He said, oh my God. What God wants to do is so big in our lives. See, forgive me for even saying that, Lord. What God wants to do for the kingdom, not just because he wants you blessed, and he does, but some of us have gotten off course in the body of Christ, and we've made it about, look how blessed I am. Now, I'm not going to mention any names. That's not the point. The point is some people have gotten off. And we need to shift the focus back out on them. It's not for you. You're not blessed for you. You're blessed because we're going to need more boats. We're going to need more nets, and we're going to need more boats, and that's the reason you're blessed. Well, I'm blessed because I worked hard. Well, good for you. So did Peter and his crew. They worked all night long and they got nothing to show for of any significance. God's going to tell you exactly how to get involved. God's going to tell you what your part is. And as you ladies were up here doing such a great job again as usual, I saw something that it was the coolest thing. I saw lighted paths, a lighted path. That's the path that God has designed and planned for you to walk. Then there were other paths that were dark. And the only light on it was you, because you carry the light in you either way. But some of the paths that you travel and walk are ordained of God, and those are the lighted paths. Some of the other ones that you just chose to do, they're not lit up, because you just decided to go down that road but you still carry the light in you. That's why why you're deceived into thinking you're doing the right thing because you do have the light of God in you. You carry the glory. You carry it with you so that you can go down a dark road. But some of us are down dark roads that we're not even supposed to be down because all it is, it's consuming our time and our energy. And you have to decide right now, well, wait a minute. What am I supposed to do different? God will show you. But you have to decide that when he shows you, you're going to make the course adjustment. You know, I think I'm supposed to move closer to the church. Just do it. Just do it. I'm telling you, just do it. Don't question it. You know, I think I'm supposed to unload some of this stuff that's just costing me so much money to maintain. Unload it. It's okay that you come and you lay the money down at the feet of the apostles. It's okay that you do that. But don't lie to the Holy Ghost because I don't want you being struck dead and carried out of here. That's in the Bible. I'm telling you, this stuff is for real. This has got me, this has got me shaking a little bit because this is not what I was expecting. I went down to, to Louisiana looking for some confirmation. I needed an attitude adjustment, and I got it. I was humbled. And, and, and in humbling me, it shows me my position of power and authority. It's like, I've been called to, to lead this? Yes, in this community, we're it. I mean, there are... Many things I could say and go down different roads with you. But just so that we're very clear as we dismiss here, God's got you here for a reason. You're not here by accident. There are some people that are fighting God. They're like Jonah. They're running away. God's going to get them. And I don't know how that's going to happen, but I I, I have a feeling that God's going to start importing people to help us. That's what I believe is going to start happening. People are going to start showing up and you'll be like, you moved out here? To help? Yeah. Well, you think that's a strange thing? Because if the people that are in the local region who are, who are being disobedient, if they won't step up and, and join us, God's going to send people in who will, who will help, because we need help. We need help. Like Peter said, hey, get the other boat. My God, get the other boat. I need help. You don't tell fishermen, don't be afraid after they catch fish unless something extremely supernatural is taking place and it causes you to be afraid. Like, oh my God, I'm a sinner. Go away from me, Lord. I don't deserve this. But the other thing I didn't tell you is that when I was on the floor and the Lord said to me, Jesus was not an American Jew, and that he said the re- what we're, where we're missing is in our intimacy, 
The other thing I saw was me dressed in Middle Eastern attire. And I've never brought it up until this moment. Because there's something with that couple in Beirut, Lebanon. There's something with this couple. And he asked me, do you want to come out here and teach? And I said, uh-uh. Get thee behind me, Satan. And I don't believe I'm supposed to go out there and teach at their Bible school, but I do believe that that is a divine, supernatural relationship that we need to figure out. I believe that. I don't know what it is, but what he said to me when we were sitting at lunch with him, this is what he said to me. And get this, get, get this. Talking to this guy, him and his wife, they are running a Bible school in Beirut, Lebanon. Beirut, Lebanon. And come to find out, we graduated the same year from Rama. And as soon, this is the weirdest thing. As soon as he said he graduated in 92, boom! It's like the scales fell out of my eyes. I said, oh my God, I remember you. I, I went back home. I looked at my yearbook. They, I think they called it annual or something. I said, I remember him. What the heck? I know that that's a connection. I know it is. God's not showing me myself dressed in Middle Eastern garb for no reason. And right now, I know what I'm talking about. It's just that, Lord, I need help. And this guy says, his name is Matt. He said to me, listen, the American church has it all wrong. This is what he said. He said, really what it's all about, what it's supposed to be about is developing these relationships so that we become partners together, laborers together. It's not about conducting transactions. In other words, Minister Joe Blow calls. I've got people out the wazoo calling me wanting to come and preach here. I ignore all of them. I got people mad at me right now because I won't even call them back. I don't know them. That's... That's the problem with the American church and the church at large is that we just conduct transactions with people instead of developing relationships. And God said we're missing it in our intimacy. That speaks of relationships. Most of our time needs to be spent developing relationships with each other. That's where most of our time should be. I only do this once a week. And if you're lucky, twice a week. This right here. The rest of the time, we have to pull together and develop relationships. Because then you trust one another. You know one another. Your hearts become together with each other. Where, where are we going? Listen, all I'm telling you is that if we don't get ready, we're going to miss it. It's going to pass us by, and God's going to find somebody else. Good? No? Yes? No? I don't know if I could do all this. You're scaring me. Exactly. Jesus said, Peter, don't be afraid. From this day forward, you are fishers of men. You just, welcome to the ministry. You thought you were just going to finish your time on earth and just be comfortable sitting there doing nothing? Eh, wrong answer. You just, got, you just got inducted into the ministry with us. How cool is that? Well, that's unorthodox and a bit impractical and hard. Well, good. Don't be afraid. Just know that this is where we're at. Glory to God. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for choosing us for this time. Time is short. Time is short. Time is so very short. Time is so very short. And Lord, I want to thank you. Yes, it would be great to have the right person in the White House. I'm not going to lie to you. It would be amazing. And here's the reality. I don't know who's going to be in the White House, and I don't care. I have my assignment, and I have my marching order. And I know what I think is going to happen, but Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Father God, that what you started, you're faithful to complete it. And what you've got stirred up in me right now, Lord, I thank you that you will give us instruction, step-by-step -step instruction on what we are to do next. And so we wait for you, Holy Spirit. You are our helper. You will show me. You will confirm. You will give us the dates for these meetings with Peter McDonald. I thank you that you will give Valerie and I the confirmation of the dates and when we're to do this. And I thank you, Father God, for sending us the help that we need because we're going to need bigger boats. We're going to need more boats. We're going to need more nets. We're going to need something more. 
And I thank you, Father, that in the meantime, we are still going to grow strong in our faith. In the meantime, in the meantime, we are still going to be blessed and we're going to be saved, healed, and delivered in our families and in our lives and our minds and in our experiences personally, Lord. I thank you. I thank you that we are blessed to be a blessing. I thank you that you have called us for this time, for such a time as this. All of the clever little phrases, all of the cliches, all of the things that we have spoken, and all of the things that we have said, and all of the things that we said we agree with and that we give mental assent to, Father God. It all comes together for this moment in time. From henceforth, from this day forward, we are going to be catchers and fishers of precious souls. For you as we advance your kingdom and we don't back up off of it <laughs> whoo, whoo. <laughs> yeah oh hallelujah thank you lord oh thank you father so you just thought you just thought you were going to get by and just it was going to be comfortable you just thought lord i just need a comfortable place just to stay for a while until i get bored with it that's what you were thinking but you were wrong <laughs> You were wrong. Glory to God. And then, and then you thought, then, then somebody else thought, well, I, I'm here so that I could be blessed. I like to hear this word, and, 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 and I like to feel the presence of God, and I like to be blessed so that I could go back home and say, I got blessed at church. Well, you were wrong too. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because it's not about us anymore. It's not about us anymore. It's about the souls. Huh. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. King Jesus, forgive us, King Jesus, for looking inward. Forgive us, King Jesus, for not taking you into consideration. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Woo, I'm going to need help, man. I tell you, I'm just going to tell you right now, I need some help. Glory to God. I'm looking for a few good men and women. Woo, we're going to get a lot done. This is exciting. 